I'm Corinne Schaefer, and welcome to Create Outside the Box. In this episode, we will be speaking with artist Asia Jung about art, her personal journey, and one of her other great talents, connecting people. If you're interested in watching our conversation, please visit our Creative Operations YouTube channel under the playlist, Create Outside the Box. Asia Jung is a visual artist from Germany. Asia thought that she would put her artistic talents to practical use in medical preparation, as she loved realistic drawing and watercolor. She studied in Bochum, Germany, before starting her free art studies. When medical preparation turned digital, she then decided to take the leap into contemporary art. Asia studied art at the Mutheus Hochschule in Kiel, at the Fachhochschule für Kunst in Zürich, and at the Kunsthochschule in Dusseldorf. Since 2004, she has lived and worked in New York City and New Jersey. So hello, Asia, and welcome to Create Outside the Vox. Hi, Corinne. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. You've got some exciting projects and exhibits coming up. And before we get started into our conversation, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we met. It was in Keyport, right? It was um, at VBR, at the great new bar we got in Keyport and was at a paint and party. Mm -hmm. And um, you noticed my German accent, right? And you were like, oh, I'm speaking German. And you actually spend time in Hamburg. And I'm born in Hamburg. So when somebody says to me, Hamburg, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I really like that. And you are an opera singer. And that means something to me because, you know, as a kid, I was horrible dragging my parents to every single opera I could catch. And still, you know, I mean, that is uh, one of the things I like about you so much because I really have not met anybody here who does that for a profession. It's great. Um, well, I think it's great that you love opera. I mean, you love all forms of, of art, but it's great to be able to connect over opera and our mutual love of, of classical music. And yeah. yeah, I heard your accent. I'm like, wait, that sounds like familiar and a part of my old home. And I was like, who is this? wonderful woman and yeah so we've just become fast friends and we'll get to this at the end what of were you painting that day what was that we were was painting that? Was that a winter scene with yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah there was the purchase with yeah, the least interesting part of paint and parties right because it's about like other things but <laughs> Yeah, but it was a great opportunity to meet you. And yeah, and we'll talk about this later in the conversation, but you're a great connector of, of people. And so you are kind of, you brought me into your fold of the artistic friends and the artistic community um, in Keyport. And that's meant so much to me because since moving back to New Jersey during the pandemic, it's just been so hard to like meet people and connect people. So mm. connect to people. And so to meet you and your open heart and to connect over opera and music and art has just been a huge, huge gift uh, since moving Oh, that's back. great. But you mentioned Hamburg. And again, I lived in Hamburg for almost eight years. You grew up there. Mm. How how did that influence you as an artist or did it? I don't know. I mean, stuff like that is so hard to tell, right? Because I am who I am and I don't know who I would be if things had been different, had I grown up at a different place. I mean, I moved away from Hamburg really when I was young, but um, I was... Yeah, the early memories, we were so proud about Hamburg. <laughs> that was really, we thought it's the center of the world and we really, really loved it as kids. And I, I remember that as a thing, you know, and it was dirty, there was prostitution around, there was heroin. And the only thing we got to hear from our parents was don't walk away with anybody else, right? And yeah. we didn't and it was fine. So it was very... You know, it was very relaxed and it was in the center of this big city and we really felt like we owned that place. I mean, I um, this this feeling to belong to a place, I had that again when I lived 12 years in New York. I really felt like from day one, like I'm a New Yorker, I'm belonging here, yeah, which is pretty easy in New York, right? Because everybody is crazy and everybody fits in their, in their own way. Um, and it's big and it's dirty and it's difficult, but you know, um, I 
I like that. I like that feeling and I still do. So yeah. maybe that goes back to Hamburg. I mean, maybe you had a completely different experience of Hamburg. You know, you, you lived there so much later and you were grown up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I lived in a different and section and, and yeah, yeah, it was a different experience. Um, but I have noticed, like you said, like people who are from Hamburg are very proud of Hamburg. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, mm -hmm. yeah, Hamburg pride to the city, which I understand. It's a great city with its own character and uh, so much culture and so much history. So I totally, yeah. I totally get that. So before becoming an artist, yeah, you actually, we're going to go into a more practical field. Let's say you were going to go into medical preparation. Um, can you explain a little bit about what that is and, and why you wanted to go into that? Well, I was, um, you know, that was in my early mid 20s. And I had become really, really good. Uh, with uh, a realistic drawing and watercolor and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I had developed there a real obsession. <laughs> and um, I did not know where to go with it because I knew that it's not exactly, uh, you know, that would not have fit in any of the arts. Since at that point of time, I lived in Cologne and it was the time of the, uh, the Neuen Wilden. It was like a, a post punk era kind of thing and it was definitely not something where sitting you know in front of an object whatever it is with your watercolor and your three hair brushes and be very particular about it that was a conservative thing and I knew that so I wanted to see where can I go with that kind of skill and I knew it's more a craft it's not so much art I mean um, or whatever, and I, um, I like that idea to work for something to have my art as a tool for students to learn better when they want to become doctors. That is what it would have been. Um, but what happened at the same time is that CD-ROMs became uh, accessible for every medical student, and we didn't need these objects anymore. So we were kind of like the last generation learning this profession with the hope to get a job in that field. And then all the institutions, they close their museum. And of course, everybody learns now online in a very you know, efficient way. So uh, these kind of artists were not needed anymore. I was lucky and I still, um, I, I, I mean, that time I had them for three years. It's so typical for Germany, right? You learn something and you really learn it. <laughs> yeah. And a bit more than you really need. Um, it was great because it gave me this, um, it gave me this bumper, it gave me this, um, okay, you know, I did that. I actually went for a real um, education and I got my degree and well, now I can be, now I can be nutty, right? And I can just go ahead and go to an art school. I think there was, I always had a fear just to be completely stupid and have nothing <laughs> where I can fall back on. And um, that education is actually like nothing. <laughs> I mean, I literally can't do anything with it right now. You know, I, I learned a lot of casting techniques and that was great and a lot of medical stuff. But um, it was more for me an excuse to say, OK, I did my part. I tried. <laughs> and now I just I'm just an artist. Yeah. So like, that's what's so funny is like, despite all of your efforts to be practical and realistic about things like life yeah. and the universe had had other plans for you. So then you switched yeah. gears and like went just for, okay, now I can be nutty. Now I can be crazy. Now I can just pursue art. And you studied in Kiel, uh, mm -hmm. Zurich and Dusseldorf. Um, what kind of training did you get at these different institutions? Was there a medium that you focused on? Did you continue to focus on the, on the realistic drawing? Um, I did a really very different things over, over these years. And, um, it was great. I mean, that is probably what what is the first thing coming to my mind. And it is um, it was not a time and our professors were not the ones from the generation sitting us down and learning whatever I act, tempera techniques or you know, that just was not the thing anymore. We had really ambitious young artists and professors there. And it was uh, it was just a huge 
thing to try to figure out what can we do in our time, what is going on. So it was a lot of research. It was a lot of with each other. It was was really a big community. And um, we, we learn. We learn a lot. And I'm sure some learned so much more than I did. I was always on the brink of, you know, from here to there. And oh, no, now I want to do this. And now I want to go to Africa. And, and, <laughs> and so I could have, you know, I could have gone further there. I didn't apply 100%, but I I really liked it. But um, it is not about technique in that sense anymore. You don't sit down anymore and learn things you might need or not. It is up to you. You have to figure out what 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 does it mean for you to do art. <laughs> and it was not so much about is this a good drawing? Mm-hmm. It is more like what 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 am I doing? You know, what am I, you know, what am I putting out here? Um, and I still think that is the most important question. The quality comes and goes and whatever. Um, that is not the main thing. It is more about, you know, what what do I waste my time with and other people's energies too? Yeah, where does it where does this thing has a place in this world and now? Speaking of, you know, art, and you brought up a lot of like big topics that I kind of want to get into a little bit later, but you know, while you were growing up and while you were studying, like what other artists or what other works inspired you or gave you inspiration everything (laughs) and that is kind of um that is still still the same you know I just don't grow up I mean in in Hamburg when I was really little what was a nice thing we were really living in the center and not close from uh not far from the art museum in town you know the uh, Kunstmuseum in Hamburg and I I I loaded myself up as a little kid with all the medieval art there. I loved that. I was really afraid of a lot of contemporary art at that time because it was aggressive, it was political. There was Joseph Boyce around, you know, things look literally scary. But I, I I got both of that, you know. I got I got the pleasure of looking at um, medieval altar builder and at the same time at very political work which was, you know, 1970s Germany and the terrorist Father Meinhof. And it was, a, was really an exciting time. And um, I was right there. Um, it was great. But that, but that all mixed to this thing that I know everything counts, every kind of art counts. And that is not it's not about that and I um later on I went from one artist to the next and I would read everything about Francis Bacon and I would go to uh, Paris or to the Centre Pompidou just to see that or that painting I waited of course my four hours outside of the Uffizian and Florence and mm. you know whatever um whatever was there and I could fill my brain with and I'm not the best in studying. I forget things. So when I'm getting back to it, it's again, completely exciting. But um, that is how it always was when I was living down in Zurich a while. And then I, and one summer I worked in Munich and then I was in in Italy a lot. And then it was about Botticelli and Fangelico. And I, I was literally studying that for a while. Later on, when I came to New York, it became a, well, you know a lot what was going on here and the um, abstract expressionists and uh, Jackson Pollock suddenly popped up and everything what had to do with that that is just how I do it when I want to think about art and uh, when I uh, want to look for other people I just get make myself consumed by one person Mm -hmm. And I look around there and then I go on and everything can be interesting, I think. I mean, everything is maybe too much because there are things that are just simply boring, but you don't find a lot of material about that anyway, right? Yeah, that's true. (laughs) It's very very simple. Some people, they live in this illusion that there was good art in former times because there was Angelico or there was Boyle or there was whatever they are into or think they are into. But um, if you look much closer into these times, there were actually very little. <laughs> and there are only just a very few 
we we have now uh, documented and we know about and it was just a tough life and not so much uh, left over. So now we live much more in a world where there's a lot of nonsense going on and a lot what is really not worth to be looked at, but it happens anyway. <laughs> and, it, and a lot of really exciting, great art and art institutions and society is really trying to be supportive. So we are not not in a bad time now for art. No, not at all. Um, you brought up New York. Um, what made you leave Germany and come to New York City? Uh, there were a lot of personal reasons too. It was not like, oh, I have to start now <laughs> my career in New York. And it, that was maybe like, no, that is too ridiculous because it is. <laughs> it's a big city, but I, I really liked it. And I, I needed for, for some reasons, I just had to leave Germany. I love Germany. It is, no, actually, I don't even know if that's true. I mean, I love certain places in Germany. I love memories I have and, um, and parts of my family and, and all of that. But um, it, is, it is not a place where I wanted to grow old mm -hmm. or children or all of that and um there is something like it's there were good places in germany but i never felt like a really belong yeah <laughs> and it is weird that i come to new york the first time just to visit and it was like direct you know this yeah <laughs> and i i really honestly never felt that much at home at a place then I felt in New York at home and I lived there longer I, mean, I lived 12 years in New York City that is um, was longer than I lived anywhere else and I, I just left because it's so it's so exhausting and I didn't know how to do it anymore with two boys and you know life shifts you and you take you know other routes and other adventures and you know who knows what the future brings you know um and fortunately yeah. we're not that far from new york and new jersey so right and i want that my boys become rich with something and then they have an apartment in the lower east side and <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> exactly that, that's the big plan that's, that's a plan yeah so you mentioned like you're not sure how american institutions go about teaching teaching art but when you came to New York and and you were comparing you know your training um and what you saw in Germany and Europe to what's going on in America like did you see any differences in the approach to art between you know Germany and Europe and the United States well you know when I was in New York and I I had uh my group of friends there um a few came from Europe I mean, that is New York too, right? We, yeah. we all come from wherever or uh, people who were born in, in the US, they, they had been to Europe. So it felt more like, it did not feel like, oh, I compare this one to one to Hamburg or Berlin or wherever, you know, I really knew um, how it felt. It, is, it, it didn't work that way. It is, it is New York. I mean, when you are in a scene, whatever it is, or in, a, you know, friends, and you all go for the same thing, <laughs> all these moments where you are like, oh, they are all so stupid. And probably you are the most stupid one. So, you know, these dynamics are always around. And then probably I had said sometimes something about, oh, you know, this is so America. But I didn't feel it actually that much in New York. I, I um, felt always like they were really, really sophisticated people around and they really want to think about art and they um, are not superficial. It doesn't fit the cliche. They are just a bit better <laughs> in small talk than Germans are and that I like. So there's a lot more energy going on. It's much easier to, to you know, to connect with people and, you know, then you lose each other again, but that is life. So um, no, I didn't see that. I, I see that in, in New Jersey since I had moved out from New York. I, I feel, you know, but I don't even know, should I compare that to Europe or should I compare that to a, a city like New York? Um, so what what is really the the American thing to approach art? I'm, uh, and I, I want to be careful with that because I just, I, I don't want to be <laughs> the European one 
who declares every minute she is not satisfied with her life or how other people behave. Oh, I would have never gotten that in Germany or so because that is, you know, it doesn't make me happy or producing art in a better way. What is there um, is a bit of difference in language. And that is, that is there. And sometimes um, I feel like language is a result of how we think about things. And when language is very narrow, it probably has to do with a narrow kind of thinking. Mm. And there I'm going already very far. I know people might not. No, I would not like that if somebody talks about me like that. Well, there were so many bad things to say about Germans, so go ahead. <laughs> and I, I, I'm fine with that. Uh, so uh, here I get to hear a lot these superlatives. Uh, do I use the right words? Superlatives? Superlatives? I don't know. Yes, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's awesome. This is awesome. This is great. Everything is great and amazing. Uh, or people don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. So it is in between these extremes and there is um, there's a bit, uh, there's a lack of patience. Mm -hmm. I notice, you know, they're just is looking and figuring it out and asking questions. And uh, there is definitely an overview of the word talent. Mm -hmm. People are so talented. <laughs> But then, I mean, an, uh, an American artist friend of mine, she said res recently to me that she hates it when she hears that because she feels like, you know, are they, are they not valuing at all that I'm actually working really hard? You know, don't cut it off by just saying, oh, you are so talented because that doesn't say a thing. But um, yeah, that is something I, I feel feel a lot. We were, we were talking more. Mm -hmm. Or I think we were. Maybe it had to do with we were younger, we had no kids, we were hanging out at art academies, you know. But yeah. that is just something um, I notice often that people just really are very, very short with art. It's like you either like it or you don't, or you don't have anything to say. And um, that I think is not, not really a great way uh, to develop more art and um, to communicate, we, co we communicate with language. It is like that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it is a funny thing how little problems people in America have to stretch the subject food or where do you go for, um, for, for vacation or for, you know, how much is your rent or your mortgage or, you know, these practical things. There, there's a lot of exchange and a lot of words and a lot of details, but you know, these things in between the lines when you talk about art, um, that is not a thing. I think sometimes people feel more at ease talking about practical things where there's clear answers. And with art, where you're getting into things that can be subjective, you know, meaning one person might see one thing and one person might see another thing. One person might connect to one work. Another person might not and connect to something else. And I think people sometimes feel intimidated by art and they're afraid of saying the wrong thing or being wrong or looking stupid. So they never engage in the conversation because they're just so afraid of looking stupid and, and looking badly in front of other people or their peers. It's hard because you can't say everything is, is art or maybe you can. People will have different opinions about that. Um, but I think that there should be a way to let people know that no matter who you are, you can enjoy art and you can talk about art. And there isn't necessarily always a right or wrong when you're having that conversation. That is right. And the, uh, the best way to get there is, of course, to engage people in art at all, right? To do mm -hmm. something together, start at some place and get everybody going. And that would be would be wonderful. And therefore, you got to cut out the idea of talent and greatness, you know, the great artist and the real artist. That is something I've never, I think I never heard in Europe, you know, somebody is a real artist. And the other, what, what are the others? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so and funny. people have imposter syndrome. People feel like, 
I am an artist, but maybe I'm not because am I only an artist when I make this much money? Am I only an artist if my artwork shows at these museums? And I just think sometimes when you're valuing yourself in this kind of like checklist of like, it's only art if, and it's so dependent on, I hate to say it, financial success a lot of times or how many people like your works. And the thing is, is that historically, if we look back at a lot of artists who are popular, you know, I mean, Van Gogh was not a millionaire and Van Gogh was not super popular during most of his life. But even, you know, someone on the street knows who Van Gogh is now. So how do we really rate, you know, what a successful artist looks like or what successful art looks like? Because sometimes you need time and context. Yeah. And there is already, of course, you know, we take somebody like Van Gogh to talk about and what what does he have to do with us really, right? I mean, you know, that is he's dead, long time, and he, he plasters every most boring bank building with a poster, you know, like, and then it is really, um, it doesn't, and nothing against his art, art of his time, but that is even something that we should not have in mind when we are thinking about ourselves doing art in our time. And um, success, but success is it's a difficult thing. I mean, we struggle with it our whole life long, right? I mean, how do we make a living? How do we pay the bills? And we are vulnerable. We want to be like, but then you know, it is, um, these are these are all it's all difficult. And and if we are an artist or not, these things are life, and they are really really difficult. I think for artists, just the main thing is really to have community. I think there's no way around. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be an artist, if you if you want to feel good, if you want to figure it out, whatever that it is, um, uh, you need community, yeah. and that is how it goes. I mean, every every little thing. Usually, when people look through it, how did I get from here to there? You know, that it usually has to do with somebody else you like and you hang out with and that person told that person about and then this and this happened. And you, why did you like each other? Because you probably paid attention to each other. Yeah. We're doing things together. You were actually asking real questions like you invite me here, you know, and you take the time to talk with me. But these are big things, you know, that is different than getting... I just wanted to say different than getting drunk in a bar, but there might not be so different because then you talk and there is a, there is a moment too. But yeah, it is it is important to pay attention to each other and to have, to have real interest in what the other person is doing. And that has to go verbally above um, it's great or I don't know what to say. That is not enough to really connect. And I think that is that is important. And once connections are there in the art world, I mean, we had great studio visit groups in New York City, for example. Logistically, it was so hard because, you know, then the subway was not running or one person had to get to his fourth job or a kid is puking. Or, I don't know. It was just such a disaster until we got finally together. But, um, I mean, it was to me always amazing how much interest we develop by being together. Yeah. Even if the first thing was, oh, I don't care for what he is doing. But hey, when you listen to somebody, suddenly you are interested. Suddenly yeah. you are. And suddenly you develop like a thing like, how did he do that? Or what did he say there? Oh my gosh, I had the same thing. Or, you know, and something poof, opens doors. And suddenly you, you are talking about things you kind of knew before. You had a little interest, but you never developed a real feel for it what it is uh, so I think you need to find the time to come up with all the stupid stuff that came to my mind again there was one <laughs> funny thing with uh, an artist I studied with in Zurich in Switzerland and he had won a prize for something for a painting and um, then he was very excited with me because he was like maybe I never paint such a good painting again in my life the typical thing you know like that was it and then he was telling us 
that somebody came to him who he didn't really know, stopped him uh, in the in the art academy and said, "Hey, I had a dream and it was about your painting," and oh, that wow. freaked him out. And he told us, you know, that what what that what I did to him that his painting was in somebody else's dream and we had time and then we were sitting there and it was going from one person to the next everybody was thinking about it and then it was suddenly about what is art in dreams and art which is not your own art and which you might not even really remember but it comes up in your dreams and then you tell another artist about that and then you know you got suddenly um you know that mm -hmm. is you open doors and these doors get only kicked open if you either confront yourself with people who come with their own life, their own experience, which are not yours. Don't always stick in your own yeah. garbage. Not good. <laughs> not effective. Or you confront yourself once in a while with things you don't naturally like. Yeah. And I think that is important too, because um, that is what is happening <laughs> a lot in New Jersey, I think, you know, that people surround themselves with what feels comfortable and do that more and more and more and more and your world becomes so small yeah. and it doesn't, art does not kill. No. So why not once in a while, you know, confront yourself with something that doesn't make you feel good and figure out why and when you want to confront yourself with all these things you really, really like, and it would be great to spend a bit more time on why do I like it? And again, communicating helps uh, very much because we have our, we are prepared, right? To answer our own questions. I like, I like humans. I, I really, really like our species. And I think it's enormous that we are the only ones doing art. And that is so, and we should, you know, we should pay attention to that because that is what makes us different. And um, when we surround that and, and just accept like, oh, I don't have to do anything with it either because I'm not creative. That is what, you know, what people say all the time and they never tried or I don't really care that much or I like these things. They are just like this and that. And I always like them. Then we really cut out a big big thing of what we are and you're right we're we are the only species that i know of that creates and and that's funny that you say you know of you know like all the others we don't know yet <laughs> i just want to be open i mean for all i know like you know down in the ant caves they've got some artwork that i can't see you know mm -hmm. but it's true like we're we're the only species that creates art whether that's visual art or performing arts i don't know of any you know chipmunks putting on plays or concerts yeah. you know or you know the birds when they're doing their their songbird calls, there's much more practical reasons for them making their bird songs than just, you know, creating music as, as birds. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting point. Like if, if this is what makes us stand out, isn't it interesting to explore that? But you are very interested in, in animals. A lot of your, your work, again, with staying with the very realistic drawing, but it's, it's focuses on, on animals and a lot of times horses, you have your, your beautiful artwork behind you. Um, and what you do, which I find so interesting, is you have a lot of art that compares the structure of the animal, say like the structure of the horse with the structure of like architecture, whether that's a, a cathedral or a building or, you know, whatever you're, you're inspired by. Um, what drew you to this this theme and topic in your art? <laughs> that um, that really happened like that. Oh, it was great uh, how it, how sometimes things come together. I was actually before I uh, started combining the horse the horse with the Gothic cathedral. I was in Cologne. That was the last time I was in Cologne uh, a few years ago, and I had so many photos of that huge cathedral in the center of Cologne, and I. Um, I had a few things with horses there 
It, it's strange. Just, you know, how it happens sometimes. And then it, it, it dawned to me that these are really the two things, you know, when teenagers start drawing, then it's like, oh, well, horse is really difficult. So I would draw a horse. And, <laughs> and then it's this fantasy art thing of, you know, when you are young, the Gothic Cathedral, that this romantic notion of the backwards and the fantasy world, which is which is funny because both of these things are for me more reality because I'm I'm riding horses and I started riding horses when I was four years old. So for me, horses are not so much. I mean, they are of course they are pretty. They they are dogs are pretty. Birds are you know. You can't judge how an animal looks like. I mean, unless you take a cockroach, that's kind of the next thing. They are just, you know, they are what they are and they are good. But um, there's a reality to it. And then there is what people think they are or hope they are and how they are used. And I, I like this combination because these are both these huge things, which are actually pretty lame when they turn into art. And it is, it feels like so freeing to use both of it. Like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. I use the dumbest thing I can grab, but I, I actually mean it. So <laughs> it is, um, it is funny. And I, I think, of course, of Art of Povera too, uh, where, you know, horses for it, where the 1960s presented in a gallery in Italy, just to like a little protest thing, you know, like here, that is what horses actually are, because there were a lot of rich people around who would constantly commission the, um, you know, the portrait of the really fabulous horse, and it was painted in a very conservative way, and uh, uh, Arte Corbera and his new art movement in Italy at that time, they said, you know, look at them, they are, they are huge, and they smell, and they poop, and they fart, and they pee, and here they are, they might kick you. <laughs> and these are horses. And um, that was at that time really a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it shows how, how you tweak around a thing, you know, when somebody like me draws a lot of horses, then there is not only one reason, you know, mm -hmm. I say, oh, yeah, I'm living in New Jersey, I'm riding horses, right? It makes sense. And yeah, that is true. And on the other hand, it's the last thing you really want to do to be accepted in any art world in our times. Okay, and that is why I'm doing that. And you know, it, it is um, sometimes it's a, it's a game, mm -hmm. you know? And then, of course, it comes down to, and that is maybe, maybe the biggest Thing, I think for for artists, why do we do something and how do we do it? Uh, we actually have to work. If we don't work, uh, we are not doing it. Mm -hmm. So you gotta trick yourself into what becomes your thing and whatever it is and we are usually embarrassed about what we are doing <laughs> there are very very few who really say oh I'm so sure I'm doing here the right thing and I'm really smart we always hope we are smart and we are good but we doubt that anyway every single day so the best is to figure out something what really keeps you going so for me yeah that's it's great. I mean, I I really, really like to be with horses and I know them in my way and I can use that and I can bring that together with the fact that when I'm drawing horses for people, I might have the same interest because they are riding too, or at least they own one. And then, and then, and, and Gothic, Gothic kid peoples, I, I grew up with that. I come from Europe. I, I love architecture and I still do and um, I miss the real medieval architecture here that's nobody's fault <laughs> but um, I miss it and there is something about it which really makes me breathe deeper and I like the functionality about it but but you know that is again my history but it's so easy to combine it and to um, literally keep on going doing art because doing it doing it itself that is not it's not the big deal everybody can do art and it is not painful you just do it um it is like riding the bicycle you are 
keep on going, <laughs> but putting yourself in the mental condition to do it, that is hard. That's and true. That is hard. And you, you got to create it out of zero. Nobody helps you. That is all you. And um, it is not as these stores like Michael's or so suggest you buy your things, you have your corner and the lighting is good too. And then that's not how it is. You know, you have to figure it out. And with opera, it is funny, you know, because sometimes operas are long. That is a great thing. So <laughs> for me, it's very helpful, for example, to take, um, to take something like Barry's Macbeth and just let it run the whole thing. And then I start from the beginning again. Uh, just because it gives this enormous feel of room and silly, silly, silly importance and the drama and it's happening right now. <laughs> you know, it is. Um, and in that room, in this bubble, um, I don't know where the time goes. I keep on going, doing my thing. The opera is going and it is stupid and embarrassing and I don't want that anybody sees me doing what I'm doing because it's so silly um but everybody finds their little things it's interesting what you're saying is that like the process itself is extremely personal and only you can do it and you set up whatever atmosphere that you need and you're like don't come in don't look at me it's like almost like someone walking in when you don't have any clothes on yeah Um, but then at the same time Once you create the art, it opens up from this personal vulnerable position. It opens up to connect to other people. It opens up to have shared experience and and conversation. And I think that's really great. And again, you're drawn to these subject matters and you have your personal relationship with it. What are other people's relationships to it when, when you come together and discuss your art? And what I thought was funny, there was another time we were speaking and I, and correct me if I'm wrong, you were talking about how you started doing the horses and combining it with the cathedrals. And it was after you started combining it that you realized, wait a second, if you think about the structure of a horse, they've got these spindly legs, but then they've got this massive, beautiful, heavy frame, you know, and yet they're able to jump and ride and do these crazy things. And then you think about a cathedral. And you think about how ornate and how the cathedrals keep standing. You were like, you know, if you think about it, a cathedral standing and being solid and a horse standing and being solid, they're actually quite similar. They're a one. It's all about static. (laughs) Yeah. But it's like how, how it's constructed, even though you're taking nature and something that's man-made, you know, is similar in a way. And they are both wonders in this kind of way of, of, putting the natural with the man-made structures together. But I don't think that was something that you set out to do. It was something as you were creating, you went, oh, there's some parallels here that I didn't even realize I was making. Am I wrong? Yeah, yeah. no, no, I was not thinking about it like that. No, I was not. Um, I mean, there were a lot of things I'm not thinking about it in the first place, but then I'm thinking about it. <laughs> and then it changes again, um, again, my work, you know. Um, And they are horses when they are sleeping, they are standing. I, you know, what, of course, I always knew, but at some point I thought, this is so crazy. This is like a building. Art is really a push, pull, and back and forth, and it goes in all directions. So uh, when, uh, what people, and that is actually something I hear more here than I heard in Europe. I think that people say art is just an emotional thing. And it's just about liking and it's just about opinion. And I I disagree. It is about opinion and it is about emotions and feelings are in there. But it's also about all the opposites of things. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is about thinking. It is about research. It actually, you know, it is, um, it is about emotions, but it's about calculation as well. It is, it is always also... The opposite it is actually everything what appears in regular life uh, appears in art as well. Yeah. But in regular life, we need our thinking to make the right decisions to literally have a structured life in which we can pay our bills and do the right thing to 
people around us and at work and with our cats in art, we need to thinking too, but it's for a different purpose. And um, it's just for art, right? And it's yeah. not to pay our bills. I mean, when we pay the bills with our art, that is again a different different subject, but um, it's it's all all in there. It's just not as structured. And yeah, there are there is stuff where thinking comes into place. Yeah. In art. It's not it's not a process one does just like meditation. If it's about that, then you know, then it's really a good idea to use the coloring books from Barnes and Nobles. Or so <laughs> that is um, you know, that's great meditation. And you use colors and you do something with your hands and you can later give it to somebody and somebody might like it. But that's not art. Are there mediums or topics or themes that you haven't explored that you're interested in exploring as an artist? Yeah. Look at there, it's funny too that it's uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> always when I look at my backyard, which is pretty big, I got a big backyard because when I bought my house, I thought my boys would like that, but I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> and I always look at it and I think like, oh my gosh, I, I want to I wonder, want to do big three-dimensional work. I don't know yet what that exactly might be, but and it's funny. It starts there, you know. It is like I want to do something with this space. I don't know how to approach that yet. I mean, it, it is. I, I like doing murals. I like to do bigger work. I did murals during uh, my studies at art school too. I did that actually for my art degree in Cologne. I did murals outside in the city of Cologne. So that that is the thing, you know, when I when I see space, I, I think about ooh, what what how could I change my work to be there? Um, but um that is, you know, it will it will come up. Something will come up in in that direction when I you know, cook it already out of it, maybe completely the opposite. Who knows? Uh, I mean, right now I'm I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing, but that can change from one day to something else if if something pops up. What motivates you to keep creating? I, I think that is not really the thing anymore. I don't know if it was ever the thing. I mean, the... Uh, you know, some people, when they start teaching, others are, they come up at least, you know, in Europe where you don't make so much money with students at art schools. And um, it's just if somebody wants to do art and they are young, you know, a good suggestion is try not to do it. Just try to stop. Because, <laughs> you know, when you put too much into it, you will so disappoint yourself and then you will stop anyway, right? So there are not many people who really keep on going, really keep on going. But when you are one of them, then you don't have a choice anyway. And that is, that is, is, is the thing. I don't need a, a motivation to... I mean, some there are there are things they happen, and I'm highly motivated, and I really, really, really want to do something, um, and that is of course great. And these are just all positive moments, which mostly have to do with any kind of connection to other artists. Yeah, that is really how it is. Um, from there come these moments where I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Not not motivating things are frustrating. And I still want to do, and these are then stretches of times where I'm really doing horrible stuff. I mean, just awful art. <laughs> yeah, but everybody goes through that. I mean, everybody goes through periods where they feel, you know, great. And then, and then people go through periods where they're feeling not so great about what they're producing. And, and yeah. I think it's just the human experience. And it's funny because I feel similarly to you. It's like creating to me is like breathing. It just, I have to do it. And if I don't do it for whatever reason, like I feel off, like if I miss my practice or I miss something that I want to do creatively, um, I start getting cranky because again, it's just something else that feeds me like, like food and air. But I know, you know, a lot of people who are artists and, and performers who 
they need to have a specific project, you know, like they're not necessarily always self-motivating. It's easier for them when it's like, oh, I have to create this specific thing yeah. for this exhibit or yeah, I, I do better with practicing and keeping on track when there's a specific show. Otherwise they just feel like they're floating around. They need a little bit more structure and, and guidance. And yeah, I think that's just a personality thing. I happen to be more structured. So for me, it's like, I'm going to do it every day. Um, because that's just, that's just how I am. Um, and I just find it interesting yeah. to know, you know, how people come at, at creating. I think I do that too. I mean, I, when there is really nothing lined up, I, I set my own deadlines, yeah. I set my own things. I make up my own projects and they are, um, they are often not, uh, on the nose. They are not like, Oh, I will create this body of work. <laughs> and then I will have so much, but that's not how it works. I always have to open back doors yeah, and plan something completely else, which kind of like is only a way to crawl towards something. And, um, you know, and then things are happening. So it is a very, it's, a, it's um, uh, you have to trick yourself right? <laughs> Often because a lot of things don't happen in the, in the direct way, but yeah, creating your own stuff, creating some kind of project. So this, this romantic thing, I'm just getting up in the morning and I bought something um, that is not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, that would be, be nice. I don't even know. I don't even know, you know, that is, I, I mean, a lot of, a lot of things happen out of, it's not always when you have the best conditions that you produce the best work, right? That is a thing also. I mean, I know a lot of people who are so much better when they are a bit sad or when they are angry, <clears throat> you know, under pressure, that's another thing, you know, and, and one doesn't want to admit it, but you know, that is then you you know when to stop <laughs> because you don't have all the time in the world or you know your mood or against the grain or you got to do something you really don't want to do or but you have to figure it out again there comes always in again for for all these things you need an artist community to tell other people that you you are in this struggle that you are not feeling like you are completely insane or at least feel insane, but you find the other people who are as insane and we, we are weird. I mean, it is, I don't like that to put art and artists on a pedestal because it's just something what belongs to life. It yeah. is just uh, people do art and it was always like that. <laughs> it is what and um, you can be creative in any kind of profession. I really believe that. That is not the point. But um, uh, there are certain things where it's definitely easier to talk from artist to artist. You started getting into it um, earlier, you know, is, is creating, but you also have life. You know, the idea that you're always creating under perfect circumstances is a myth. Like nothing's ever going to be perfect. Yeah. Uh, and we all have, you know, real life and responsibilities and jobs and all of these other things that that come into play. You're a mother of two sons. Like, how do you how do you find time um, in your busy schedule to to create? How do you carve out that time for yourself while you're juggling all of the other things that you need to do? Yeah, it's not it's not that it's really working out <laughs> i mean there's always something what is not done right it is not that it, it's not that i really carve it out and it works out it's not like that it's just it's happening you know it's happening i mean my my sons are growing up and i'm i'm lucky because i got the dad right around the corner and he's great so that helps and other things help, of course. Um, but that is, again, you know, that is about being, you know, don't think you are alone. It's not like that. You know, Play with, with all the others on this planet and 
Um, and, and then I, I do like it. <laughs> my, my younger one is very much into music. So it's often that I can't choose anymore, really, what I want to listen to. All right, go. I listen to what I want to listen to and go on his nerves. But there's sometimes this thing, like everything is busy and one walks over the other. And, you know, but they do their thing, too. I'm not the only one. Yeah. They, you know, they, they carve it out too and, and make room for themselves. For drawing and painting, I mean, the, the worst you can do to yourself is, is be there and then nothing is happening. A friend of mine, uh, Beth Cooper, and she's uh, painting abstract paintings, beautiful ones. And she just takes care of that. She has only a little window of time in her studio and then she runs out <laughs> and goes to a job or does whatever because she knows if she would spend there more time she would probably mess up that part of the process so she has to run away so it is you know when people think oh you know a painter like eight hours and then you sit in front of it like that that is not necessarily how it's happening i think the only answer for all that kind of stuff is you got it would you got to do it. If you want to do it, you got to do it. If you if you say, oh, I don't have time to do it or not enough time or I don't have the space. Uh, these are excuses before you even figured out what you need. Yeah. Uh, because maybe you don't need space. Maybe you do weird little things. Giacometti did little sculptures. They fit into matchboxes. You know, I mean, it is, um, <laughs> but for other reasons. But it is yet the, the first thing is you got to do it. You got to do it, figure it out, not taking the single piece of art too seriously because it's not what it is about. And, you know, and then you, you will figure it out. But the easy answer to all of that is when you are an artist, you do that. You yeah. will. You, you will. will do it and you will figure it out. Yeah. And maybe you will be a pain in the ass for everybody around you your whole life long. <laughs> and maybe you have no success whatsoever with your art, but you will do it. Sometimes you need life to interrupt you. Sometimes you need to walk away and think about something and come back. And that's actually how the process is supposed to be, you know? So like yeah, you know, it's more organic. Like we can't, we can't control everything, even though sometimes that, feels like that might be easier, but you just, you can't control everything. And, and maybe that's a good thing sometimes. Oh yeah. No, I think that is, um, that is definitely sometimes a good thing. And then again, we complain, like, you know, <laughs> I complain all the time, you know, that I don't have enough time for it because of course the process never ends, you know, and I always feel I could have done more. I could have done better. I could have, mm -mm -mm. Yeah. and then I give this situation to fold or that, or that person or whatever you know I always find something until you know like oh now it's actually this complaining does not make you a better artist there is no there are no excuses you are what you are and um <laughs> you can't complain because it feels good so that is again where you need your other artist friends then you can complain with each other but then you go back anyway you know kind of on the same same theme because we're kind of hitting on these points of, you know, reevaluating how you look at things. Are you really seeing things for what they are? Communication, you know, mm -hmm. um, how do we communicate with each other? Uh, striving to get beyond the easy surface words when we're connecting and talking to yes. each other. Um, that leads me to this very complex question of, well, what do you think art brings to society? Why is art important in our society? Well, when art is not present in society, then there is a problem. It's just an indicator. Of, you know, a, a society where art is not valued and supported, is, you know, <laughs> yeah. there might be might be bigger problems. And of course, where art is, is censored and and all of these things, um, it is like, mean, look at the Nazis in Germany, right? I mean, this is, why, why wanting to kill artists? Just, and it is so, but yeah, that is how it goes, you know? Um, and uh, societies which are just not, not really caring about, um, about their people and everybody, the, the money 
or everything culture really goes directly right to somewhere else i don't know <laughs> so that is it, it's always it's kind of like an assessment of a functioning society that art is taken care of and when that is not the case then you hear voices uh, who justify that because what what is art for you know and they step into exactly that thing your art is for nothing there is no there is no functionality it is not like that it, it doesn't do anything it's not teaching us a language it's not it's not doing that but it's it's just deeply human yeah it is something which should not even have to be asked art yeah. was always with us i mean when we started to distinguish ourselves a bit and we didn't do that actively of course it just was we were different than other mammoths and suddenly right our graves were decorated uh, we paint our faces we started apparently we don't know that really but i'm sure we started singing and making music and dancing and all of that so it is not it's just like like yeah okay let let's make us a different species then it might be negotiable but as long as we are humans there is art that is just how it is throughout this conversation you've been bringing up how important community is and how important it is for artists to not create in a bubble and isolate themselves that it's really important to find you know, other artists to talk to, to connect with, uh, to share a life experience with, you know, because we are human beings and we do connect in those ways. And yeah. you have many talents, um, but one really great talent that you have is you're a connector. Like I brought up in the very beginning of our conversation, you know, we met and I was so happy to to meet you because you have such this, this great warm energy, this inviting energy. But then you were so kind to not only offer your friendship, but you were like, hey, I've got this group of artists. Do you want to come? You want to meet these people? And you gave me the gift of opening up this community to me and, and allowing me to meet other great individuals so that I too could, you know, share in this process and not feel, you know, isolated, you know, especially moving back to New Jersey and trying to find, as you said, trying to find the other artists, the other weirdos, the other people that, that think like you. <laughs> and what's interesting about the arts is sometimes people because it's a hard life and because it's challenging, it's because it's competitive. Sometimes people, you know, don't feel like they can, they can share um, or don't feel like they uh, want to open themselves up to so many people in the, in the creative world. But why is it so important to make room at the table? Why is it so important for it to be collaboration over competition? I don't, I don't, think that there's really really room for competition uh, it is i mean i say that now because my bills are usually paid in different ways you know i don't i i don't have to compete with marianne or with my friend michelle or heck or whoever for getting this and this grant and pay my mortgage um but that is a completely different subject. You know, so maybe if I were on a different level, an artist, and I would really compete for very important prizes and grants, maybe I I would say, yeah, it's about competition. Um, I, I don't feel like that. I don't want to compete with friends. It is, it is really like that. And that is kind of what I said before when you are getting really interested in somebody. And you ask questions and you see the process, you will weirdly like what that person does, you know? Um, or it becomes part of you. I mean, with Marianne, for example, Marianne McKay and I, we had that art space, art space 88. And I mean, I, I kind of saw her like every day doing her things. And it is, I mean, probably her colors went into my dreams too. And um, I mean, that was was nearly like a part of me <laughs> you know and probably my stuff for her you just enrich yourself by knowing what um, is in somebody else's head which I think is really the most exciting 
thing at all, you know. And we have that happens in somebody else's head. You know what are they? What how does it come out in that choice of material and colors and whatever? And uh, then the thing is this good or is this not so good or what? You know, um, suddenly in the background when these are actually friends, it's really you are enriching yourself um, with. Them. So everybody, everybody profits as long as you are really paying attention to each other. We should get together because we do similar things on a very, very, um, very basic level. Similar things, and um, and then it it makes everybody else's life uh, richer. And then it's. Um, it's another thing, of course, that we we need sometimes help from each other, which we can't really get from other people because they don't see the necessity that is just like that. To go back to that, uh, that subject, competition or not, should we compete? Um, I mean, here are great art societies around in Mammoth County. And I like, for example, you know, David Diva is doing this great job out in Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury Guild, and um, the Art Alliance in Red Bank, and Ellen Martin at the uh, Oyster Point Hotel, and uh, Artisan Collective in, in Red Bank. And uh, usually there are things attached, like either you are able to make money there, you know, you can sell your art or um, art societies or guilds try to get in money by doing competitions. You know, we got a watercolor competition, first prize gets this and this, and we have these and these people in the jury. And um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that is the right approach, it seems to be for a lot of people the right approach, but I don't, I mean, we can get all these um, photographs or paintings or whatever they are. Um, why even trying to figure out what is the best one? Yeah. This is so, you know, is it really, is it, what, what, what is that the best one? And that is, that is something where I personally think and some some musicians would disagree with me. I'm I'm not so sure, but it is it is really in art. It's in visual art. It's just not like that. It's not the one person doing one thing and then it's measurable the quality better or worse or great great art. Not so hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you have the one to ten or one to twenty. I I don't know how that works because it's not. It's a it's a product of life done by one person. And, mm, oh, yeah. and, and there are so many artists that do sometimes something what is really, <laughs> really astonishing and surprises the artist himself or herself, you know, and it is big and then they don't get that moment back. But that is not that because they are suddenly not a good artist anymore. That is just because circumstances and time and everything warps. So, you know, so it is, um, I, I don't know if, if competing is of course necessary when there is the grant for whatever, and you know, have to give the money to somebody, you know, you can't give it to a hundred people, but then, um, well, there should be just more grants. A lot of times when they have grants, they allow for a certain number of people. And I think that yeah. is to um, go to what you're saying, which is, is that it's very hard to, it would be wonderful if everyone could be supported, but there's just not the funds for it. So they have to right. have people present either their art or their ideas, and then they choose from that you know, who they want to give the money to. But I think that it's smart that it's not just one person. Oftentimes mm -hmm. it's a number of people because who's like a lot of these things are apples and oranges. You can't say that this apple is better than this orange. So having yeah. opportunities to support artists, um, I think is the way to go. And that is what you're saying, like with a competition, you know, I know from doing, you know, competitions as an opera singer, it's like, you know, how do you say who the best singer is if you have a soprano, a tenor, a mezzo, a baritone? They're all so different. Yeah. How do you say who necessarily is the best one? Yeah. Yeah. 
it is it is really and you should not even force yourself to think like that you know <laughs> yeah because people are thinking well that person i'm not saying this is the way to think but i think that uh comparison is the thief of joy and people will often think well why why is their work in this gallery and not me yeah or yeah. why did this person get this gig and not me? And why am I not in that role? And, you know, I think that focusing on art, kind of like the game of golf, where you're competing against yourself and you're competing against your score and your game is your game is the best way to kind of come at your artistic career. It's like you're in a sense, if you're going to compete, you're competing against yourself and you're trying to grow and improve and learn as an artist, as an individual. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to, you know, interact and engage with other artists, not to come at it from a competitive standpoint, but to come at it, as you're saying, from a learning standpoint of how can I connect from to this person? How can I learn from this person? Yeah. Um, how how is this relationship going to expand my 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 life and it all comes nice. with empathy you know and emotional yeah. intelligence which let's face it translates to better to better work yeah definitely yeah definitely unless you are a person who really feeds of anger yeah. <laughs> which happens too you know i mean i i know that that there are artists they work like you know, they really feed out of the negative and that gives them energy and that has to be accepted too. But it is always, these are the exceptions. I'm, I'm really, I really believe that you're completely right with that. You know, when you are good, having good relationships and you have people who really, you know, you're feeling close to, you're feeling comfortable with, that leads to you feel better. You will do better and you will again grow with each other you grow with each other that is like that and something will come out of it so speaking of busy you have some exhibits that are going on right now and one that's coming up where can people go to see your work yeah yeah and i'm always with some works at least uh at debbie eisenstein's artisan collective in red bank you know, there is uh, my work and she, she can talk about what I'm doing and she takes people's commissions for me. And uh, so that is always there. <laughs> um, yeah. And everybody can, of course, contact me and I'm happy to connect with anybody about horse riding or art. <laughs> and you have your exhibit in Spring Lake until the end of October, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Gorgeous building and uh, wonderful people there. Great place. That's the Spring Lake Community Theater House. Theater, yeah. Uh -huh. exactly. So that's through the end of October. And then coming up in November, you have your exhibit at the Oyster Point Hotel in Red Bank. Right. And uh -huh. you will be doing, I guess the exhibit opens on November. On the 3rd. On the 3rd. Third or 4th. Uh, let me just have a look. 4th. <laughs> 4th. November 4th. Yeah. So anyone who's interested in going to the opening of the exhibit at Oyster Point Hotel in Red Bank, that is on November 4th. And then you're giving an artist talk on? On, I said the 13th. Did yes. I say that? Yes, November yes. 13th. November 13th. Yeah, that will be 3 to 5 p.m. Um, yeah, that is, um, I, I do like artist talks. If it's me or anybody else, uh, I really like that. There's always something happening. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And I will include all of the information for your exhibits and information about your website and how to connect with you in the show notes. So anyone who is watching or listening can find out all of that information and go see. Or as you said, you can buy your art at the Artist Collective in Red Bank uh, so you can get some actual original pieces. And all of that will be in the show notes. Yep, that's great. Yes, exactly. So I just want to say a huge thank you for taking the time out to talk about art and life and really how we connect as people. I thought that was like a big theme today. How we yeah. like connect as people. Yeah. Yeah. That is um that is always the center piece of it, right? Yeah, exactly. So Bye. thank you so so much. Okay, Corinne. Great. Then I see you later. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Create Outside the Box. 
please subscribe, rate, and share our podcast. You can listen to Create Outside the Box on Spotify, Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. Check us out on our Creative Operations YouTube channel, where you can subscribe to watch our interviews. You can find and follow Creative Operations on our Facebook page and on Instagram at CO underscore Creative Operations. For more information about Creative Operations, please visit www.creative-operations.org.